Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath School this morning, where we will be studying rewards of faithfulness. Um, but before we get started with our lesson and jump right in, we will have a testimony from Sister Naomi. Um, hello. I just wanted to give a testimony of how God has answered my prayers. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, I was praying for a client and I pray for my clients a lot. Um, I just prayed very much more focused for this client and I just saw how God worked um, in his will and worked for this client um, even in just one day. Um, and it was just amazing to see how God answered the prayers that I had for this client. Amen. It's, it's beautiful that you can be in a position to pray for people and help people when they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, it's a good place to be in and share your light just from being around them. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Awesome. So as we know, prayer works, as we saw with Sister Naomi's testimony um, and through prayers that we've had over time. So does anyone have prayer requests or any praise reports? Yeah, I want to I want to pray for um, um, one of my good friends. Um, she just she had a baby about a month ago and. Um, the baby's father was just recently arrested. So I want to pray that they can get things sorted out and um, just that the Lord is uh, near to them and that they, they can uh, know the direction to go in. And I want to thank the Lord for the opportunities he gives us um, every day, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I pray for two families um, that are close to my husband. The one family, they lost the wife. Well, actually, both the, the wives have passed away um, and they passed away like three days apart. So mm -hmm. pray for both families, the Savino family and the Connor or Camarotis family. So, yes. Um, any other prayer requests? Thankful we've made it through another week. Yes. You're together. Just praying for my family. Yeah. Praying for my family. <laughs> right. Okay. And if we don't have any other prayer requests, we will ask Sister Lindsay to pray for our prayer requests and to open our Sabbath school. Sure. Thank you. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and for your mercy, Lord, that you care for us and um, you care for those that don't even know you, Lord. And as we bring these names before you, we ask that um, these people might know your presence and um, know your love, Lord. Please be with um, the families that have lost their wives and uh, mothers. Um, Lord, we ask that you... Um, draw near to them and help them to still see hope even when they feel discouraged. Lord, please also be with Naomi's family, be with her mother and um, the situation and the trials that she has. Thank you for blessing um, Naomi's client and for her to be able to bring them to you in prayer and um, Lord, with all the things that are going on in the world, we just, we want to place those things in your hands and Lord, give us uh, minds to focus on um, the lesson today that we might see and know you just a little bit more clearly and more deeply than we do now in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that opening prayer. And with that, we will jump right into our lesson. Uh, like I said earlier, it's called Rewards of Faithfulness. And as we look at Sunday's lesson or Sabbath's lesson, 
there's a verse here. And it's so ironic because this verse was actually my son's memory verse for this month. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard this verse over and over and over again. Um, and he had his test this week. So we definitely have heard it in our house this week. But it's, the, it's um, Psalms 19, 7 through 11. And I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to break it down where it talks about um, oh. different parts of the of what God has. So it's the law of the Lord, his testimony, the, um, the statues of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, fear of the Lord, and the judgments of the Lord. Hmm. And in each of those, it says what they are. So the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The statutes of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are, I have that right, pure. Mm -hmm. And the fear of the Lord is clean and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. Mm -hmm. And not only in this, does it say this, it says that they're sweeter than the honey and the honey and the honeycomb are more precious than gold. And they're in, in keeping them. So in keeping the law, the testimony of the statutes, the commandments, fear in the Lord and in his judgments, there is great reward. So in looking at that, I think that's a great like jumping off point to what our lesson is all about. Did you all want to say anything about like those things, how that kind of resonated with you before we jump into the lesson? You know, I think when I was a kid, there was a song that <gasps> my mom taught me. And I remember I the words I'm and thinking, like, I always remembered the part of the song sweeter also than honey yeah. and honeycomb and thinking like, what could be sweeter than honey, you know, <laughs> and right. yet it's God, it's God and his law. And, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we often think of the law in that kind of way. Like if you could compare the law to something, what would you compare it to? It's usually not honey. You know, I've heard the, the illustration of, you know, the law being like a mirror, right? So we can mm -hmm. see, you know, the, the filth of sin, but we don't think of it necessarily like that. And, um, yeah, I just like the, the comparison. I was just going to say, I also learned this as a song. And now I'm curious to know if we both learned the same song. And <laughs> You're welcome to go ahead and sing. And I'll let you know if that was the one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another time. But um, I just thought that was interesting, too, as like, learning things when we were young and the songs and it's just like reading that first three words was like it brought it back and it's just really cool how we can learn songs that way and learn verses that way and bring it back to our memory that way yeah I needed you all this week with the song to help us with this memory verse oh um, <laughs> we didn't learn it as a song um yes so let's look at what some of this, this reward of faithfulness really is about. Mm -hmm. uh, someone can read for us uh, Hebrews 11, 6. And then someone else can grab Isaiah 40, 10. I have Hebrews. It's Hebrews 11, 6. You can go ahead and read it. Okay. Um, Hebrews eleven six, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So what type of faith are we talking about here in 11? Because it, it says that... Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Is it just like, I have faith, Lord, that you exist? Or like, what type of faith is this? And it's interesting because of the chapter that it's in, which is why I'm asking that question. <laughs> I think it's the kind it, of... Let's see. It's oh. okay. Go ahead, Naomi. No. <laughs> um, I... Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, um, coming from the faith chapter, you have so many examples of people that were faithful, not just in their thoughts or in their mind, because I mean, Mm -hmm. technically faith is in your mind, but it was by faith. They were obedient. It was by faith. They stood up for what was right. It was by faith. They took action. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that it, it's going to be the same faith that God is asking us to have in order to please him. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's uh, the faith that I'm thinking of in this verse is um, that the kind of faith that holds strong through any trial or any temptation or any Thing that can that tempts to sway it anything in those ways because it also talks about believe that he is and a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and when I think of diligently I think of like no matter what gets in your way you are going to seek after God so um the faith that perseveres in a way Mm. and I think yeah I think it's it's definitely a um it's almost like an impossible faith not one that but it's not impossible (laughs) the (laughs) the faith in the impossible I should say Mm. um that that God can do whatever he says he he will do and I I like that Lindsay that you were talking about that the all the examples that are in this chapter of faith because it does go on like the beginning of the chapter talks about what faith is but then it goes on to what the the faith of throughout the Bible, um, mm-hmm. and like small snippets of those examples, being very impactful. Mm-hmm. I think it's more than just oh, I believe that God will do this today or that today. It's like true, lifelong. This mm-hmm. is what's going to happen, and I have no idea how it's going to happen. But He says it's going to happen, so here we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. And let's read Isaiah 40, 10. That was the other verse that I have. Okay. It says, see, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. So when we talk about the kind of faith we just talked about, what type of reward do you think comes along with that? Mm. Especially if he's coming with might. His arm is ruling. <laughs> and this isn't a very passive picture either. Right. And it's like, I want to say, well, it's a fair reward. But no, it's not. The Lord gives us much more than what would be a fair reward. Yeah. Um, but um, I think before a reward is given there is some element of what someone did already. Mm -hmm. You know, there is some action that is taken. And I know that the lesson kind of goes in this direction, but a reward, for example, if I, um, if I entered a contest and I put in, you know, my, my vote, that would be like, something that I had contributed that I have to do before I can get -hmm. that reward. And yet, do I deserve it? No, not necessarily, Mm -hmm. you know, and yet um, the reward is not necessarily related to my skill set or the work that I've done. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that the interesting part on, on the rewards for this is that you're right, it, it's not fair um, by any means, but it's also, you don't, you have to work for it, but you don't have to work for it is what I'm trying to, to convey. Mm-hmm. No, he, there's certain things that he says, it's by faith, it's by following the laws and the statutes and 
getting to know God and the type of faith that that requires, it really is building a relationship with God more so than just having faith because you can't have that kind of faith without a relationship. Exactly. And so the reward is more based in the relationship than the things. Yeah. I think relationship is a key word, you know, because, um, for example, um, my husband, we, we got married, right. And I do things for him because we got married, you know, like preparing his food or help doing his laundry, but it's not like, well, it's because you went to this great effort of doing it. That's just what I do because I love him. And that's, you know, Mm -hmm. um, not, not his reward, but it it just comes with it. Um, there was a really good example of, I was thinking of this week and I've forgotten it, but it will come to me before the end of tonight. (laughs) And I think it's the, the back and forth, like when you care for someone and you have that relationship for them, you're always doing the best for them. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing the best for them and they're doing the best for you, then it's a win-win situation on both sides. So it's like always giving our best to God. We shouldn't have to think about what's going to happen, whether it happens or not, whether it's good or bad. We know he's going to take care of us in the best way he knows fit because he knows us better than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of us doing our best for him and saying, having faith that he'll take care of the rest. Yes. And so as we look at that, as we look at the, um, the rewards, let's look at two other verses and they're very stark contrast verses. Uh, first one is Romans 6, 23. And the second one is John 3, 16. I have Romans. I'll take John. Okay. Okay, so we'll start with Romans. Okay, so Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, and then John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so there are two very um, distinct options that we have here when it comes to the eternity. What are those two options? Yes. And what? Getting what we deserve. Yep. Dying. And then the gift of life. Mm-hmm. And... With this gift, I know we were talking about the reward, and now we have this gift of life. Um, Why would you choose one over the other? Why do we choose that? Why do we make this decision? There's many reasons, I would think. But I also think of, um, like, I think of just some that come to my head are, like, being deceived, not... um, knowing that what we are choosing is harmful sometimes and um when we do know that it is harmful and we do know what is right we're still fighting against the temptation to do to go the other way versus choosing christ and it's a constant battle (laughs) and as long as we keep that relationship and we keep coming to God in prayer, it gets easier in a sense because he's fighting for us and with us in that sense. You know, um, I still haven't thought of my example, but um, when your birthday comes around, I don't, at least at this point in my life, my expectation is not that my friends will give me a gift. You know what I'm saying? But if I give you a gift, it's not because 
you deserve to get a gift. Well, you had your birthday, so I must give you a gift, but Mm -hmm. I do give it to you because you're my friend, right? Mm -hmm. If you weren't my friend, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a gift. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, um, it's still a poor example, but, um, Yeah, I think we find ways to um, make, uh, we find ways of giving and taking that are very human. For example, I had a friend and we went out to eat and she paid. So I felt indebted to her. So the next time we went out to eat, I insisted on paying, but she said, you don't have to pay for my food just because I paid for your food last time. We're friends. It's not you owe me and I owe you. And I have thought about that because it's, it's a situation I've come to a lot. If my friend paid last time, then I feel like I should pay this time. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's fair. But she was like, it's friendship. We're not keeping track. And I think as humans, we keep track, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's what's fair and we have to keep what's fair. And yet with God, it's never going to be fair. It's never going to be fair. We can never outgive God. We can never even be like on the same level. But as humans, I think we want one thing to count towards another thing Mm -hmm. you know we want in our minds to see it be even feel like we're contributing the same amount it's never going to be that way Mm -hmm. I mean I think that leads to the the difference between salvation by grace and salvation by works Mm -hmm. because in human nature we want to think that it's by works and just what you ex- the, described, it's not, it's by grace because it can never be fair. I mean, we do so many bad things. You know, mm-hmm. We can never do enough good to take care of the bad. And it says the wages are sin or death. Um, but eternal life is a gift because we can't do enough to cover for Christ dying on the cross for us. Like there's never enough we could do. Even if we tried our entire lives, we could never repay that. Mm-hmm even as the wealthiest or the most talented or the longest living person, like not even close because I've heard people say, Oh, well, Jesus gave his life for me. So I'm giving my life for him as if we're even now. The one-to-one written. It's like, no, that's we're not humans. That's not, it's a, that's why it's a gift. And I think we have to, to realize that it's not a one-to-one in order to appreciate the gift. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like if you, you gave all you had, so you gave up a birthday party to someone and like, all you could do is get a cake and have some friends come over and sing. And they're like, oh, that, you know, they, and and they honestly enjoyed it. And you see the joy on their face. And then it comes around to your birthday and there's like a large extravaganza and and you're taking on a trip and you're doing all these things. And it's not because you gave a birthday party. It's because they were giving you a gift. Um, or I love the 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 um, examples. Like if you listen to a children's story, like Adventures in Odyssey or something, where someone will lose a wallet and the child's like, well, I could just take the money out of the wallet. And it's like, 20 bucks or I could be honest and return and they return it and the person gives them like a thousand dollars and they're like who wasn't expecting that you know it's the unexpected and when you have the element of surprise and the unexpected then you really can appreciate the gift for what it's worth Mm -hmm. if it's something that you feel like you're entitled to you're not going to appreciate it Mm -hmm. I remember the example I was thinking of there we go so when you said you something online. So I saw this short video and you guys have seen videos like this before, right? Mm -hmm. The guys in Walmart, he has like this Jersey for some team. I can't remember what team it was. It wasn't a really well-known team. At least I don't know it. 
that doesn't mm-hmm. say a lot. But um, he has this jersey. He says, hey, he walks up to this man and his son and he says, hey, I just need one more dollar to be able to buy this jersey for my son. It's his birthday. I really want to get it. I'm just short. And so he asked this guy and this this guy looks at him. Says, I don't have a dollar. All I got is a five, but I'll give you the five. You can get it for your son. He says, no, I don't want to take a, you know, five. I just needed one. He says, no, you go ahead and take it, take the five. Um, and he's insistent that he go ahead and get it for his son. And the guy said, well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I have the money. Actually, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to test your kindness to see if you would be willing to share. And then he gives the guy a thousand dollars cash. Mm-hmm. He says, this jersey is actually for your son. I want to give it to you. And then you know, you like this team, let's go, you know, let's go to the, the game mm-hmm. and you can like get something autographed from the guy that owns it. And he, you know, he gave them <laughs> lots more than a dollar. And, you yes. know, the guy had been, um, the guy that had originally offered the $5, he had just gotten out of chemotherapy. He didn't have mm-hmm. a lot of money, you know, he was stretched thin and it was like, did this man earn it? Mm. no he just had to take one little step of kindness yes you know and I think that is what God wants from us he just wants us to take one little step towards him just to reach out to him and then he wants to say hey I got this for you Mm -hmm. and here's here's some extra here too and I want to take you on a special trip And I want to, you know, give you special opportunities. And that's what God wants to do for us. And we're over here going like, oh, no, I'm not going to give up. I can't give my dollar. (laughs) I got to keep my five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've actually seen some of those where um, (laughs) they, it was the one that was outside of a grocery store and they did something similar. And the lady, she was like so rude to the guy. Um, And then he went to someone else and did the same thing. And the guy gave her like, like gave the other person the money and she's like, oh, I'll do it now. And there's like, no, it's too late now. Like Mm. you were rude to me and told me, no, I'm not coming back to you now after she realized what it was really about. Right. Mm. So let's look at John 14, one through three. We'll start just with verse one. I have John 14. Okay, he just reverse one for me. Mm-hmm. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So why would our hearts be troubled? Why would Jesus have to say that? <laughs> Any number of reasons, really. <laughs> we find a lot of reasons for our hearts to be troubled. <laughs> yes. Um. In this case, I guess this comes right after John 13, where Jesus is telling them that he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to go away. And then Simon Peter had denied him. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh man, I missed the bus today or, you know, something really, you know, every day it was like, The Messiah looked at him and even somebody that he had pledged his life allegiance to, he was said, oh yeah, actually today you're going to deny me three times. Mm -hmm. And what's so disturbing about it to him is like, first of all, it's, it's wild to imagine that he would do that because he was so sure. And then this is Jesus. Jesus is right about everything. How could this possibly be true how could he think this about me so i mean it's a very reasonable time to have your heart troubled and yet jesus says yeah don't worry don't be don't don't be disturbed just calm yeah all the way around just believe in god you know go back to the very first step Mm -hmm. just keep your foundation yes So if we can read verses two and three, and let's talk a little bit about how Jesus calmed the fears there. Okay. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would 
have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So how did he calm their fears? What did he say to them? And what is this all about? Um, basically saying this world is not, this world is not where, where it's at. This, this is, this is just for a time, mm -hmm. but in the end, I have a plan for you beyond this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these, this is not the, the end of the road. This is just a part of the journey. Yeah. And he kind of also touched on like, um, I know that I am leaving, but I'm coming back for you. And that was troubling to them sometimes before this, when Jesus would say, I am leaving, I'm, and some were like, no, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and it was their whole idea of why Jesus was there. Um, they didn't fully understand why Jesus came and it was his purpose to leave. Um, and the specific way he was leaving and all of those things as well. Um, but he reassures them as I'm going to come back for you and you will be with me where I am going. I like in this version I have, it says in verse two, um, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So it's like, Jesus is saying, you've trusted me this far. I'm telling you that I'm going, I'm coming back. And you're upset because you don't have the faith. Believe that I'm going to come back. If I, if I wasn't going to come back, would I have said it? Mm -hmm. I've done everything I said I was going to do before. So mm -hmm. stop. And I think that is uh, the case with us so many times where we have to be reminded, you know, I cannot lie. <laughs> God's like, I literally cannot lie. Um, but you act as if you don't believe what I say and tell you to do. All right. You don't believe that I, I say I have this great reward. Um, so in saying that, why should we trust in the second coming? Because he said it. <laughs> yep. If it was me, then you never know, right? <laughs> I might mean very well to do something I set out this morning with a full intention of completing my, my goal. We're supposed to make a rabbit house today. Full, full plans to do it all. No rabbit house. I mean, I, I started it. <laughs> I got some steps. I put some time in, but you know, there are things out of my hands, but it's never out of his hands. Mm -hmm. When he says he will do it, he will do it. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing we have to understand is that our timing is not his timing. Yes. He does it when we're, when we're prepared, you know, just like in that verse, it says, I go to prepare a place for you and where I am, you will be also not when you want to come, <laughs> not when you say that I'm ready to go. <laughs> because there's going to be some times where you're just like why am I still here I'm so tired Jesus you're there and I know that you have a place for me can I just come and he's like no we're not ready for that yet mm -hmm. not at that part mm -hmm. so let's look at Revelation 21 we're not going to read the entire thing but there are some verses I would like to read um, that digs a little bit deeper so if we can read uh, Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4 and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. So what is this new Jerusalem about all about? Mm. Heaven. And it describes it as a bride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to a wedding? Isn't that like one of the most exciting parts of the wedding when the bride cracks through the door? Yes. Yeah. The dress and the hair and just the full glory of the bride. Even if you've known her all your life, you saw her yesterday. It's just yeah. something about the wedding. You know, I want to say, I don't remember. I mean, I remember these verses, but in my mind, if you asked who's the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ is his church, right? We yeah. are the bride of Christ. But here we had the holy city the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, or it says prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Mm -hmm. That may be a, a visual analogy so that we can understand the glory of it. Mm. Right. And I wonder at this point, do we have God's people? They went to heaven, right? For the thousand years. So are his people now in the holy city that's descending onto, onto the earth? Mm. Well, and this was the vision that John had. So at that point, no one would have been because it was a vision of what would happen, right? Right. So it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't happening right then, but right. he was, he, he was dreaming or he was in vision that the city was coming down so maybe it wasn't that detailed but um i guess it's something that that we we know that we will ha have been in heaven with god for a thousand years mm -hmm. before heaven comes down to earth right mm -hmm. so at this point his people are in the holy city that's coming down to the earth that so sense. that's interesting so that's when we'll be uh, that's the that's the marriage part yeah <laughs> it's not it just is, jesus yeah. coming back it's you know the where god is coming to dwell on earth with his people yeah. so i was about to to say that he said he will dwell with us mm -hmm. um but if you don't have a relationship now why would you want to dwell with him then that's i wouldn't want to marry someone i didn't know yeah right you gotta have that relationship yeah. first Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot about that when we, we make the decision of how we want to spend our time. It's like, we don't want to spend time with God now. If we don't enjoy that, why would we want to go to heaven when that's literally what it's all about? That's mm -hmm. like saying, um, I don't like broccoli. And then someone says, let's go to all you can eat broccoli restaurant. And you go, yes, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but a I think that we have to be careful that we're not falling in love with the, the, the concept of peace and love and no more tears that we're actually falling in love with the one who gives that and the reason why we have, don't have that. Yeah. Oh, that's deep, Crystal. That's because, deep. you know, I have seen people and they're like, in love with the idea of getting married, mm -hmm. you know, they're in love with the idea of having the big wedding and all the flowers and the flowy dress, you know, after all they've been looking, I had a friend, um, that had been looking at bridal magazines from like her eighth grade year, you know, yeah. like picking out just the right dress and the colors and what type of flowers, like she was just I'm going to say obsessed with the idea of planning her wedding. We weren't close, but I think sometimes it's that same thing with God. People are like, oh yeah, I want to go to heaven and yeah. I want to have no more pain and no more sorrow, but they're not interested in getting to know the God that wants to do all those things for us. And really a wedding is very empty if it's just the wedding mm -hmm. and it's you're not in love with the person. Mm -hmm. 
I was going to add to that of like marriage being a gift and then being in love with the person who's giving the gift. And as you were saying that with God, because that's the gift he's giving to us. And um, that's how I was going to also say it as well. And I think that, well, let's go, let's keep reading. So let's read five through eight, the same chapter. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what is the difference between those who are saved and those who are lost? Mm. Well, the, those, those that are his people overcame, right? So they didn't give up. They continued. And then in verse eight, it describes the, the others as fearful, unbelieving. So both of those have to do with faith, mm -hmm. abominable, murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars and so if you do those things once are you forever lost no no we'd all be lost nope <laughs> all of us right all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god it's about consistently choosing to come back to him mm -hmm. and consistently choosing the relationship with God over those things. And, you know, if we look back at the end part of verse six, it says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. His people are the people that thirst for him. Yes. Mm -hmm. That they want him above all else. And they might trip up and they might have problems but they get up because they want him mm -hmm. um i think i've mentioned my rabbits already we got these rabbits a couple of weeks ago and um they're a little bit ridiculous okay <laughs> so they have i'm they have a hutch and they have like a fenced in enclosure okay so 80 90 percent of their diet is supposed to be this hay, right? It's dry meadow grass. And then the other 10 or 20% is going to be like fresh vegetables and greens. Okay. My rabbits have found a way to escape their enclosure. Okay. They are so one tracked. And so once months, once my rabbit had escaped and he had tasted the grass outside the enclosure. That's all he could think about. That's all he wanted. Like I would literally be standing there and watching my rabbit climb all the way up the fence and jump off the top. It's almost four feet. Okay. This is a small rabbit. Okay. And he's climbing. He'll, he'll push his nose as far like any corner that he can find. Like I'll be chasing him around the yard, trying to get him to go back to the hutch. But he's tasted that green grass and he's tasted those dandelions and he wants nothing to do with that hay. And that's what God wants for us to be completely one tracked and just focused in whatever way, regardless of what's going on around them. Rabbits don't listen for anything, <laughs> but he wants us to want him because we've tasted and seen that he's good. And that's, 
I'll, we won't rest until we are, um, we are satisfied with him. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, as the deer panteth for the water or as the rabbit yes, for the grass. yearns after the grass. <laughs> yeah, another thought that came to my mind was a phrase that I've heard in a song most recently but um it's do we love him because of what he can do for us or do we love him for who he is mm -hmm. and what he can do we love him for what he gives to us or do we love him for what he already has done for us and answering like those questions and in the song he goes to say sometimes I don't know but I know that I want to believe and I want to keep coming to you. And um, I thought that was tying into what we're like talking about, chasing after God for who he is, being satisfied with who he is. Um, so, yeah. I mean, because when you look in some of the other, when the other verses we read, it said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. It's saying, it keeps saying, believe in me, have faith in me, trust in me. That's like the only things that we've been, we've been asked to do here is have faith, believe and trust. And I think the rest of it just comes because I know this, this whole lesson was about stewardship and giving and, um, and offerings and just the whole financial, financial ways. But we don't have to worry about that. Like the birds of the air, and I know we've read this verse many times in this quarter, the birds of the air don't worry about what they're, they're wearing. The, the fields don't worry about what they're, they're clothes um, or the birds don't worry about what they're eating. Yet we, we, we do, and we don't trust God to do that for us when we are made in his image. Mm -hmm. So instead of chasing behind all these other things, if we chase behind the giver of the gift, the gift will come. Mm -hmm. So, and when you look in Matthew 25, there's a parable of the talents and we won't read the parable, but it talks about this, um, this owner who was traveling and he had three three servants and he said, okay, I'm going to leave five talents with you, two talents with you, and one talent with you. Um, and he goes away and they each do something different with their talents. And then they come back and he asks, asking for an account of that. So we will read uh, 25, 20 through 23. And let's see what happened with these talents. I'm sorry, this is what book? Matthew 25, 20 through 23. I have it. Okay. Um, Matthew 25, 20 through 23. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, and good, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So before we talk about what happened with them, uh, the Bible I'm reading has a little blurb about a talent and the talent back in the Jesus's time. And it says a talent in Jesus's time was a valuable sum of money worth about two years wages. Mm. Just so we can have some context on that. <laughs> so what happened to those who were faithful with their talents? They were rewarded with more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, and what do you think the talents represent? Resources. Uh, skills that we have learned 
or is given to us by God? I think it it's encompassing of all the stewardship aspects. So I think it is resources. I think it's money. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's time. I think it's skills. Yeah. I think it's the things we hold near and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, it's what we do in everything because like your rabbits, Lindsay, when you're focused in your one track mind, everything that's around you is going to go as a, a push toward that thing you're one tracked about. So if you're trying to get to the grass, let's say the rabbit was a person, not a rabbit. The rabbit would try to pay to get out of the hutch, mm -hmm. negotiations with the squirrels. <laughs> um, he would, he spends all this time trying to figure it out. So all day long, he's just like, how do I get out? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Can I go up? Can I go down? Can I can I build a hole? Let's say he decides he's going to dig his way out. He's going to spend all this time trying to dig to get under it and to get to tunnel out. Um, and he would have learned how to tunnel because that's a, a skill that he has. He would have, you know, negotiated with the birds to say, can you bring me sticks? You know, everything that he has would go towards this mission. And I think we don't do that a lot. We don't put everything we have towards our mission of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Um, I think mm. we separate it. We say church is church, life is life. Mm. And sometimes the two will blend a little bit and they may overlap a little bit, but what I do for work has nothing to do with what I do for church. That's ministry. That's making money so I can survive. When really everything we do should be a singular purpose um, to build a kingdom. Mm So when it, you look at how they were rewarded, when we look at it in that context, why is it so important when you hear them say, um, when you hear the masters tell them, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trusted with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. What's the impact of that now that you think of it in this way? If we give everything to him, then he will give us much more. Mm -hmm. As I think of it in your video example, Lindsay, he had a, he had five dollars. Yes, stretched thin, and he was willing to be kind with the five dollars. And it was like I could trust you with the five dollars. Now imagine. God, who knows everything about us, knows our hearts, know how we are. And he says, okay, I'm going to give you an apartment. And you, you pray for somewhere to live. This is your apartment. How are you going to treat it? Mm. Are you cleaning it? Are you saying that this isn't mine? I don't care about it and letting things go. Are you letting the kids write on the walls because it's not yours? Are you or taking care of it and have pride in it because it is your home and I gave it to you and you prayed for it. I gave you a place to live. How are you treating it? Are you using the money that he also has given you to pay the bills on time? Or are you going to eat out every week or are you buying clothes that you don't need? Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing with the little that I gave you? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, the statements I've heard outside of even in looking at it biblically, they say that money makes you just makes you more of what you already are. Hmm. Oh, yes. So if you have a little money, if you get a lot, you're not, doesn't change who you are, it just makes you more of who you are. So if you're a generous giver and you love to help people, when you had little, so you would give a dollar to a kid who's raising money for their Pathfinder Club, or you would, um, if you saw someone hungry, you would give them whatever you had to eat that mm -hmm. could help them. If you have more money, you're just going to do that more. You're going to have the resources to do that more. If you're a miser, if you're very stingy with your money, if you're greedy, if you're um, manipulative, 
having money is just going to make you more of that. It's not going to change your character. Mm -hmm. And so I think seeing this parable of the talents really takes us down that road because it says, I could trust you with a little, therefore I can give you more. You're not getting more than there's something that God can't trust you with that you already have. Mm. And a lot of times we're not content with what we have. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly looking for, oh, I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. I need a bigger, what have you, but we're not taking care of the things that we have. So why should we have more? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So what do y'all think about that concept? Yeah, I mean, we need to be we need to be uh, trustworthy with the the little bit first. Mm -hmm. Yes, and not just because we have this idea that we can get more. Mm -hmm. Being trustworthy with what we have and the little that we do have, because that's what God would want for us. That's what he's asking us to do is be responsible with what we do have, following his will, following his guiding of what to do with the little that we do have. And in turn, this is just what we get, not um, what we're supposed to be going after, in a sense. If you look at the life of David, he started as you know, a shepherd boy, and he did everything he could when he was a shepherd. He was fighting the the lions and the bears to, to protect those sheep. And he, and God says, if you're protecting sheep that way, imagine what you'll do with my people. Yes. I never thought about it that way. Hmm. This is a little spin on some of the things we read all the time. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> And so keeping our eyes on the prize, let's read Romans chapter eight, verses 16 through 18. I thought of the bunnies again. <laughs> bunnies are our analogy for the week. Yes. Keeping the eyes on the prize. <laughs> Going to the green grass. Holy Spirit is definitely dropping some nuggets this week. <laughs> Romans chapter eight, verses, verse what? 16 through 18. <laughs> The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Mm. So if you are an heir to something, think about um, Queen Elizabeth passed away recently and her son became the heir to the throne. What did he inherit? Everything that she had had. What is position. Mm -hmm. um, power. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know how much power they have over there social power yeah but you said not everything that she had now I'm just asking what did what did he inherit what was hers everything that was hers mm -hmm. was it only the good things no no i would say also the uh the word that comes to my mind is stereotype, but like the image and oh, stigma. Yeah. Lindsay said the responsibility. The responsibilities. If she left any undone business. Mm -hmm. Debt in any way. Yeah. Imagine if there was a, an ongoing war in the palace against uh, the, the servants. <laughs> Yeah, that would he inherit, inherits that over he inherited prime example. They installed a prime minister right before she died. She did. Mm. And then shortly after that, she was no longer there. Mm. You know, so all of that he inherits. He inherits all of the good things and the stressors. Mm -hmm. So as Heirs to God. It says that we are God's children 
and because we're his children, we're his heirs. Um, what should we expect to inherit? What well, God has. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, I guess here, and it's talking about suffering with him. Mm, so yeah. we suffer and also we receive the glory because we are now, we're family, right? Mm -hmm. So in the family, we have, you know, the joy and the love of family. Mm -hmm. But that also means family, we're cleaning the bathrooms together. Mm -hmm. We're folding the clothes. Um, and those things all come together as a package. I told you that. that's part of being the family. You gotta, you gotta take care of your clothes. <laughs> and I'd add the um, responsibility as well as the image that that comes with. The image and uh, reputation that comes with, um, whether it be a good reputation or a bad reputation, a negative reputation on people what assume um, Christ was doing or assume how he was going about what he was doing. You know, at the beginning this evening, we, we talked about like comparing it to a, a relationship, um, mm -hmm. like a husband and wife relationship. And I, I keep coming back to that in my mind because, um, Imagine if someone came um, and they offered you money and gifts and beautiful clothes if you would be with them, mm. right? They offered you delicious food, exciting entertainment. They offered you everything that you could want, mm. right? But then there would be you would want at some point, he would want to know that you felt the same way about him. Not just that you wanted to spend time with him because you liked the things that he was giving you, right? And I think in that context, we can all understand like, oh yeah, if we didn't really love him, then we would definitely just be using him, mm. right? But sometimes I think, in the situation with God, because we can't see him and because the relationship with him is already, you know, he's giving us a lot more. It's harder for us to imagine like that. He really wants our love in return mm -hmm. that he wants us to be willing to give as well, even though we don't have a lot to give mm -hmm. just because he wants real love. He doesn't just want you to sit, you know, in the passenger side. Mm -hmm. He really wants all of you, you know, and um, in um, our relationship with God and even in our time in church, I think sometimes it's easy for us to just say, okay, well, I went to church or I taught Sabbath school, or I gave my tithe or my offerings, um, or I have in my will that I'm going to give the rest of my assets to the church. And that's enough. But when we're really talking about stewardship, it includes those things. But the number one that he wants is us. Mm -hmm. He wants our affections and our energy and our desire to be to him, not and just I, our stuff. I think, Lindsay, the, the examples you just had, so I go to church, I return my tithe, I'm giving all these things, I'm putting the church in my will. I think when we do them because we think we have to do them, we miss the mark. Mm -hmm. When you have the relationship and you love someone so much, so let's say you have a favorite niece or just someone you love and they they're always at your house they spend time with you you enjoy their company but you're playing games with them you watch them grow up when they come over we're, you're making cookies together like just the time with them is 
is invaluable. And every time you're together, it's just a great feeling. And even if, if there's animosity, you're longing to make up with them because you can't stand to not be happy with them or to, mm -hmm. to, to be disconnected from them. Mm -hmm. Everything you have, you want to give them. You don't want to see them without at any given time. So if that niece happens to look sad for some reason, you're going to go buy them flowers just to make them smile. If that niece is in college and they're away and you're just in conversation or talking and they're like, oh, you know, I can't wait till I get home so I can have some of the brownies that you make. You're going to make them brownies and mail them to them. You're going to mm -hmm. do whatever you can to keep that that happy balance and they're going to do the same for you it's the same way with god like we wouldn't have to pull ourselves to church or to sing a song just so because it's sabbath or to do these things because we feel like we're obligated to do it we would want to do it because if you're not you feel lost mm -hmm. like i'm not i don't me and god we're not we're not doing our thing we got to do our thing mm -hmm. like I'm giving my money because we have this thing that we have going on and I want to give everything I have because we're, we're, we're together. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be someone telling you to do it. We wouldn't have to, to read this lesson at all if we had that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with the heirs where it shows like with um, the reason why they, they talk about we are heirs of, of God is because it does come with more than just God is God. Think about when Jesus was here. A lot of times we say, oh, I want to be just like Jesus. People don't know what that really means mm -hmm. because Jesus didn't have a house to stay in. He was going from place to place. People hated him. were trying to kill him the, his entire life mm -hmm. from the time he was born. They were trying to kill him. Um, Every time he did something good, they thought it was bad. They were trying to set him up constantly. If you saw this in a movie, you would go, I would never want to be that person because that is so stressful. Yeah, we're always like, I want to be like Jesus. And then when these things start coming at us and it's like people are trying to set us up, people are trying to take our lives, people are trying to undermine our authority. And we're going, why is this happening? Because we're like Jesus. He wanted to be like him. We're heirs. We get all of it. You get the glory, but you also get the problems. Um, so when you're studying the the New Testament, think a little bit deeper than the the great things that was happening with Jesus, because in each great thing, there was a set of Pharisees who were trying to undermine mm -hmm. the entire thing. They killed him. End of the story. They killed him. Yes. Um. So, but that's not the end of the story. It's not but the end I know of what you mean. Yes. I know what you mean. At the end of the humanity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so thank you for correcting me on that, Lindsay. <laughs> but in looking at this and understanding this and looking at the relationship, how should we live? I mean, this will be our wrap-up question. How should we live day to day? What should be our thought process? How do we navigate through life, muddle through life, essentially, but navigate through life knowing that we are heirs? focused on God pursuing okay. him above all the other things that there are to pursue to pursue him and mm -hmm. then trust that he will add all the other things that he's promised to pursuing a deeper relationship with him knowing him for who he is not for what he gives you who he is for yeah. and I think understanding that we can't without him because he yeah he knew this he knows all of this before us when you have a, a parent they tend to have gone before you mm -hmm. and they, we trust them to guide us through the difficult situations and god is god like he knows all the difficult situations uh there's a song that says um can't think of the exact words, but it's kind of like you stood in you stood in those places before I have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, God has been there before us, prepared it. He prepares us for the places we're going to go so that when we get there, we can handle it. But we gotta lean on him for 
all of it. Mm. Lean not to your own understanding. Yes. Almost yes. like he was the lead rock climber, right? Yes. And he set the holes. <laughs> He's got the, the hook at the top for us. Yeah. But it's like, when I say step in this hole, don't go step over there just because you think you know better. Yes. A lot of times we try to do that. And I think if we do that, if we are chasing after God, if we are putting everything we have into his kingdom, like the rabbits chase after the grass, these Sabbath school lessons become just, uh, why are you telling me this? I do this anyway. Nothing's <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Any other wrap up um, thoughts on this lesson? I think we're getting, we're at a good point. Awesome. Well, with that, we will wrap up our lesson uh, for the week. I thank you both for participating in this lesson. I think it was a good one. I think there's a lot of nuggets out of this one uh, that we could expound on even further if we had more time, but. We will um, stop here. And so I will say a quick prayer to close this out. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to study your word, Lord. We thank you for the reminders, Lord, the, the pieces that we, we need to see in our everyday life, Lord, for the life lessons that we get that, that teach us how to relate to you, Lord, how to become closer to you. Lord, and thank you for just being with us and revealing these things to us as we study the lesson. Please be with us the rest of the Sabbath, Lord, and we just ask that you help us to come back together when it's time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Great, so thank you all for joining us once again, and we hope to see you back here next week as we are wrapping up our quarter. Um, it's been a great quarter, but yes, we, good things, all good things come to an end. So we will see you next week and we hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.